So I can't do a can't do a talk on kudzu without getting a new anecdote. So I got a new anecdote today, which I can start the program with. Uh, our good friend from Georgia says that her husband always said, uh, "The Baptist and kudzu, they're taking over the South." <laughs> the Baptists at least succeeded. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about kudzu. Uh, it, it's a, it's a funny thing. I I have to I realize I should walk gently. I won't. <laughs> Won't be as much fun if I do. But you know it, it's uh, here, here's the thing. I, I also recognize that uh, that kudzu is for many of us uh, 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 ranks among the in, in most important things uh, about the South. Uh, it is it is part of our heritage, uh, we like to say. Uh, it's as important to us as religion, as, as the Baptist. It's as important to us as the football team, right? So if I say something, if I say something about kudzu, and I want you to understand right at the outset that I'm not going to tell you kudzu is good or bad. I want you to understand right at the outset what I'm going to tell you is it's a piffle. It's a trifle. Uh, and we've spent way too much time talking about it. Uh, it's an interesting thing, Kudzu. But the reason why we're, we're, I feel, excused in talking about it is because if we understand it, as if we understand all of history, it tells us a lot about why we see the world the way we do, why we've made the mistakes that we've made, and maybe we can learn something from it uh, because of our misperceptions about kudzu. Y you know, I grew up just like most of you did. If there was a kudzu patch, I would walk a half a mile to avoid that kudzu patch. Nobody walked through because uh, you know all the stories. In the middle of that kudzu, all those snakes. And you could just see the snakes writhing in there. It was kudzu vines, of course, but you could just see. Man, they were all tangled up in there. There was no way. If you ever went through a kudzu patch, you ran through the kudzu patch. Kudzu was a scary thing. I believed, I believed in the stories of kudzu, like you believe in the stories of kudzu, like we still often believe in the stories of kudzu. It was a religious thing. Kudzu was going to take over the South. There was nothing that could stop it. It grew a mile of whatever, mile a minute, whatever line you wanted to use. It grew so much faster than everything else, right? It's true. Absolutely. That's what we grew up believing. <laughs> there were a couple of problems. There were a couple of problems that, for my belief system, which was very strong, I believed strongly in kudzu, but there were some challenges to that belief system. The first one was my Baptist dad, who also kept horses, had a lot of horses, had some cows, meanest cows you ever saw. Remember those cows? Gosh, they were terrible. You'd run them in the woods and forget about them, and six months later, we'd try to gather them up, and they didn't even know what a human was by that time. They were mean. But we had, we had some cows, we had some horses back in the woods. And every place we ever lived had a little patch of kudzu. Now, here was the funny part. The cows and the horses got on it. The kudzu was gone. A year, two years, three years, boom, it was gone. I thought, well, that's funny. It's going to take over the world, though. It's bad. It must be really, really bad. Well, as it turns out, it really wasn't that bad. And there really was, there really were reasons to be suspicious about that. And now that I am so much older than I was when Kudzu was going to take over the world, and I realized, gosh, you know, it, it never did. I thought maybe it's time to reassess. Maybe it's time to reassess Kudzu. Maybe it's time for all of us to rethink uh, th this myth of kudzu. Let, let's, wh where did this thing about kudzu come from in the first place? I have to go back into those beginnings. I about 1870 something or another, there was a, uh, there was a great uh, festival, a great centennial. It was an Asian, uh, it, was, it was sort of to establish the relationships between Asia and the U.S. to celebrate uh, relationships. And so kudzu was one of the items brought in. 
uh, as an, and it was featured as an ornamental and as a foodstuff and as perhaps something that would be good for forage here in the United States. And it, it sort of caught on. So there was an attempt in the late 19th century to get farmers to grow kudzu because uh, it was potentially really good for cows. Well, farmers would go out. Uh, they would establish kudzu in small patches across in various areas. The really progressive farmers, they were going to do the right thing. And it would take them two, three, four years to establish the kudzu. It takes a while to get kudzu established if you haven't tried it before. It, it, it does. It does. It takes a while. Uh, it, uh, and, and you know what would happen? They'd turn the cows out on it, and in a year, it'd be gone. And the farmers, two years maybe, and the farmers would say, Man, this is silly. I ain't spending three or four years getting kudzu established to have it eaten out in one or two years. And there were some other problems with kudzu, right? How are you going to bail it? Anybody ever tried to bail kudzu? <laughs> it ain't easy. It's got all these long bites. So there wasn't a great way to harvest it either. And the farmer said, Psh, you guys are silly. Keep your kudzu, we ain't messing with it. So it kind of disappeared for a while. Except that there was an, ooh, I'm going to say this out loud. There was another myth developing at the time. And it had some basis in reality, but it was the great myth of erosion. Uh, we could talk about this a lot and, and what was actually happening to farmland in the South. The problems with farmland in the South weren't erosion. Love to have another talk where we can actually talk about what was happening to farmland in the South and why agriculture was declining so badly. But Soil Conservation Service, as its previous uh, in its previous aspects, uh, said erosion is the enemy. And we love the man, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt said erosion is the enemy. Erosion was the great evil. And so everything that was, we had to come up with solutions to erosion. And so there was, a, there was an effort to reintroduce kudzu as a way of, con, of preventing erosion because Agriculture in the South was going <laughs> farther south pretty fast. It was having real problems. Erosion was the issue. It was declared to be the issue. And kudzu was the solution. So there was an effort then. There were 70 million kudzu seedlings that Soil Conservation Service produced. It wasn't easy to produce them. It actually takes a while. And they were set out, uh, and, or at least some of them were. Uh, and, uh, and there was a guy at the time... Um, uh, who uh, was working for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Channing Cope. And, I, you know, I recognize having writing a garden column and having a radio show, I, I recognize the issues, and you've got to have something good to write about. You've got to have something that's going to catch people's attention. And Channing Cope decided, you know, I'm going to save the South. I'm going to be the man that's recognized as saving the South by introducing kudzu. So Channing Cope, in, in, in collaboration to some degree with the Soil Conservation Service, uh, decided that uh, we would develop kudzu clubs across the southeast, and we did. And Channing Cope decided we needed to plant 8 million acres of kudzu uh, in the 1930s and 40s. And he, it, it just became a real cause. Everybody, they were out there doing it. And, and about, what was interesting, about a million acres of kudzu was planted as a result of that effort in total up to about 1950. Now let's put that in context, because that sounds like a lot. In, in the 1940s and 1950s, there were somewhere between 20 and 30 million acres of cotton planted every year. Soybeans, 15 to 20 million acres of soybeans planted every year. A million acres of kudzu wasn't very significant. In fact, if you wanted to look for something comparable, the only comparable figure I could find for the kudzu planting that went on in the heyday of kudzu planting was Lespedeza. And, of course, you've never heard of Lespedeza, have you? <laughs> Lespedeza was another crop that was supposed to bind the soil and do other things. Actually, there was more Lespedeza planted 
far more Lespedeza planted during the heyday of kudzu planting than there was kudzu. Pretty interesting, huh? And yet, this went on. Channing Cope is, on the, is, on, is in the newspaper writing columns, talking on the radio. Uh, everybody's still hyped up about it. And, uh, and at some point, people began to realize, hey, this kudzu grows. Under certain circumstances, it can really grow. And it began taking over things. And then it becomes a literary phenomenon. And this is really pretty interesting. And this is where it really enters into your psyche, too. Uh, there are, it's very interesting that the first great generation of writers in the South, William Faulkner uh, and uh, Eudora Welty, read what they wrote about kudzu. Nothing. <laughs> they never mentioned it. <laughs> And somebody said, well, you know, you know, our wealthy died in the 80s. You know, she grew up in places I grew up. William Faulkner died in the 60s. He would have seen the kudzu. They would have written about kudzu. They didn't. What's interesting is, is that a generation of Southern writers who left the South made kudzu a cause. Uh, and Willie Morris uh, from Yazoo City, uh, and Willie, if, when, he, when he grew up in Yazoo City, I can tell you there was a big bank of kudzu above his house uh, on the Lurst Bluffs. Uh, there, there was kudzu there. But when he got to New York City, Willie, I, I, my, my best guess is, he edited Harper's Magazine. My best guess is, is that he didn't really, uh, he, he didn't really remember uh, what he was looking at when he grew up uh, in Yazoo City. Probably didn't know a lot about it when he was there because he left at a young age. And so when he looked for a symbol that said something about the South, he remembered that bank of kudzu in back of his house. So Willie Morris made a big deal out of kudzu. Uh, and it became a, a big fascination nationally. Probably Willie did as much to popularize kudzu in the literary world and to use it as a symbol of the South as anybody else. A guy named James Dickey. Where is it? From Georgia, I think. James Dickey's from Georgia, South Carolina. Spent a lot of time in Georgia and South Carolina. James Dickey, the, the, the poet who wrote uh, the, the, the novel Deliverance, wrote a poem to kudzu, which became very famous. It's a really interesting poem, and he uh, like a very good poet, uh, took people's preconceptions about kudzu and turned it back on them and, uh, and helped to, to further this myth. Until by the, by the time the 60s and 70s came along, uh, Southern writers used kudzu as sort of a shorthand of a way of saying, I know the South. I know kudzu. I can tell you all about kudzu. There's a great line that I found uh, from... Uh, from someone who said, all you need to, d to do to be a Southern novelist is, is to write about sweet tea and kudzu. <laughs> and, and at a certain point, this new generation of Southern writers who really, didn't under who really apparently didn't know much about the landscape saw kudzu as, as really very important to understanding the South. But they hadn't seen much of the South, as it turns out. There's another thing that's going on in the scientific community. And uh, it's kind of hard to explain how it got here, but science sometimes does not proceed in rational ways. And sometimes citations get made and somebody cites somebody else and somebody else saying, oh, this is going on, and it turns out nobody ever really looked to see whether it was really going on. Same thing was going on with kudzu. There was, a, there was an effort to deal with invasive species that were taking over much of the South and much of the United States. There was no funding for it. And so there were a few people who went around trying to raise money to deal with invasive species. And indeed, there are some invasive species that are big problems now in the South. Uh, if you, uh, have you seen privet lately? You know what privet looks like? Big problem. Kogan grass and tallow trees and other things that are big problems. They needed, needed money, and, 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 and they used kudzu as a way to excuse that. But they didn't have any numbers on the actual acreage of kudzu. And yet you see in these government reports that kudzu is, had, had in a lot of government reports from that day, that even though they didn't have the actual numbers, they said it's taking over between 7 and 9 million acres of land uh, already, and that it's growing by 150,000 acres a year. Where did those numbers come from? I tried to figure that out. In fact, I knew some of the people who were quoting them. 
And I said, where'd you get that? And they said, well, we got them here and we got it from over there. I traced it back. It turns out it came from a garden club publication. <laughs> you think I'm lying. This is where the federal funding came from. This is how they, it's an amazing thing. It wasn't until fairly recently when the forest inventory analysis actually decided maybe we need to look at the real numbers on kudzu that they actually for the first time did. And what they found was in the forest inventory analysis that about 250,000 acres of the south had some degree of kudzu infestation. That's not 9 million, by the way. That's 250,000 acres. And, 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 and they predicted that, at worst, the acreage in, consumed by kudzu would grow by about 2,500 acres a year. Not very significant. By comparison, uh, we, we're looking at how many acres of privet. Uh, oh, let's see. Privet. Uh, is, is about, uh, Asian privet has covered about 3.2 million acres and is growing compared to 250,000 acres for kudzu. So it, it really wasn't nearly as significant as people thought. And that number didn't get out to the public and we tried and why, but, but it just wasn't getting any inroads because by this time, we had, uh, kudzu was all across the South. We, if you were start, had, a, had a software startup, you called it kudzu. If you had a restaurant that was supposed to be a Southern restaurant, you called it kudzu, a Japanese vine. Isn't that funny? So it, it, was, it was, turns out that we discovered that it was a big myth. And yet, and yet in Georgia, and in Alabama and in Mississippi, we all grew up with kudzu and we all remember it. I remember it. We remember it because we were driving down the roads and it was everywhere, right? When you were bored to death driving from, driving from Jackson, Mississippi to Montgomery, Alabama, what did you do? You looked for the kudzu monsters on the roadsides, <laughs> right? It was there, clearly it was there. And we perceived that kudzu was taking over the South. What does that tell us? What does that say? Here's how most of us, what we know, most of us, what we know about Alabama, most of what we know about the South, for most of us, comes from one place, our car window. You tell me what you what what is this what is the source of information about how you perceive what you perceive the southern landscape to look like? It's what you're seeing driving 80 miles an hour down the interstate. The most simplistic, boring, impossible to decipher vision of the Alabama landscape you could have. Our perceptions of kudzu in the landscape come from car windows. It's that simple. And, and here's, here's a very interesting reason why. Why was there so much kudzu on the roadsides? This is another thing we don't think about as people and why we perceive things the way we do. We don't, uh, we sometimes don't smell our own stink. So we don't know how we have affected the forest. One of the interesting things that's happened since humans got involved is that we have made a place for vines that vines never had before. I'll show you some interesting pictures here in a minute. Galleries. Vines used to exist only in places we call galleries along streams where there was sunlight pouring in along the edges, where it could grow up into the trees. In the interior forest, vines had a tough time because they couldn't get enough sunlight to climb up the trees. So vines are pretty rare except along galleries. So what did humans do when we came along? We created new galleries everywhere we went, along fields, along roads, everywhere. And vines took off. They just went berserk. Every vine went berserk, and kudzu in particular was one of those vines because we had planted a lot of places. If there were no cattle to graze it, which there is not any cattle to graze it along roadsides, right? 
Nobody wanted their cows to get out in the middle of the road and get hit by the car, so we put fences up to keep the cows off the roadsides. The kudzu just went crazy. Covered the trees on the roadside, and we never got out of our cars. So we never knew that just beyond that screen of kudzu, it was just woods, just like it had always been. But it seems like it was taken over everywhere. Any funny thing? Funny thing how we perceive this out. So th- this, was, this, was, this was a huge factor. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things, so when I give this talk and when I write about kudzu a lot, I inevitably get people calling and, and, and writing and challenging me and saying, and, and they'll show me, send me a picture and said, look at this kudzu, it's taken over the roadside. Well, I try to point out to them that the vine that is taken over the roadside is in fact not kudzu. <laughs> it's just another southern, southern vine. It could be trumpet creeper. I guess I have pictures I ought to show them. Could be trumpet creeper. There it is. Nice, good native southern vine with an ideal conditions created by an opening, a gallery that allows it to climb a telephone pole, elite that telephone pole and all the wires around it. And I think that's a fine thing. If you're ever down around, uh, if you're ever in South Alabama, South Mississippi, and in, particularly if you drive over to New Orleans, Drive over to New Orleans sometime when you're going across the bridge, look back across the city, and you will see entire warehouses that are covered. People say, man, the kudzu's taken over New Orleans. Well, it, ain't, it ain't kudzu, it's, it's cat's claw, an entirely different sort of vine that's, that's, has a, has an, uh, where we've got a perfect place for it to climb. We've created new galleries everywhere we go. So vines themselves have taken over. So we, we were grossly overestimating the, the range of kudzu, grossly overestimating how much kudzu was out there. We did it for a lot of crazy reasons because of the way we view the world. But now the acreage in kudzu is declining precipitously, really fast. And let's hope that for the next generation we won't have to hear them yammer on and on about kudzu because of this little fellow right here. This is now, uh, we, we finally call this the kudzu bug. It was a bug that was introduced from Japan about eight years ago. It was first found around the, uh, the uh, Atlanta airport. It's spreading rapidly. Uh, it is, it, it's, it's unmistakable, it's, it's actually square. Can you see it looks like a weird trapezoid? Really, it's really quite distinctive. If you ever have any doubt, crush it. It has the wonderful aroma of knee-high grape soda mixed with stink bug. It's just, it's just the most beautiful conflation of smells you've, you've ever seen. It's a great thing. Uh, kudzu, uh, kudzu has that grapey smell, and, it, and it's, it, it's, it's like you think, gosh, that's interesting. Ooh, it stinks. <laughs> They're everywhere. I mean, I've been on patches of kudzu where you couldn't see the stems of kudzu. There were so many kudzu bugs on it. It doesn't wipe out the kudzu. It just makes it slow enough. It doesn't, it doesn't, re- it doesn't grow fast enough that, it, that everything else takes over. All the other vines begin to take over uh, the places that kudzu left behind. So kudzu's got a much, it does, doesn't have good, good prospects. Uh, for, it has even poorer prospects for taking over the south now that we have the kudzu bug here. Very small acreage of, of kudzu. So, once again, I'm, 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 I'm saying kudzu is not good. It's not bad. It's a piffle. <laughs> it's a trifle. Why? Why? Why were we so interested in making kudzu the great savior of the South, the great monster of the South, the thing that was going to take over the South? And I think somewhere in our heart of hearts, I'm afraid that we actually hoped that kudzu would take over the South. (laughs) And why is that? And so I want to talk about that for just a minute. Because it it actually makes a lot of sense. When you're going down the interstate, and, and you're going at 80 miles an hour, and you're trying to decipher what's in that landscape, you want something that's easy to recognize. You don't recognize all those trees. You can't recognize all those trees. You want to simplify it some way. So our mind always focused on the kudzu. We are always, we have always looked for ways to simplify the state of Alabama. 
And why would we be so insistent on simplifying the state of Alabama? Well, as it turns out, we have good reasons to want to do that. Alabama is the most biologically diverse state in the eastern United States. The center of oak diversity, you don't know this, the center of oak diversity isn't in the Appalachians. The center of oak diversity isn't in California or in New England. The center of oak diversity in North America, north of Mexico, is in South Alabama. There are places in Alabama where there are 60 species of plants per square meter. This is unheard of in, a, in the temperate world. Unheard of. Alabama is the center of fish diversity and aquatic diversity, not only in the United States, but throughout the temperate world. The greatest concentration of turtle species, we all grew up with turtles. You know turtles, right? We run over them all the time, right? The center of turtle diversity isn't the Amazon. It isn't Vietnam, where a lot of people thought it was. It turns out the center of turtle diversity in the Western Hemisphere, and probably by most measures in the world, is Alabama. Amazing, isn't it? Alabama is the great center of forest diversity. There are, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 12 species of oaks and 500,000 acres. That's pretty impressive. You probably can't name them all. I had to name them all when I was in forestry school. I thought if I learn all these oaks, I'll know everything there is to know about oaks because I was in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 500,000 acres. I come back to come back to Mississippi and Alabama and beat up old land my dad's got where he's got his horses. And he takes me out of the woods and he says, okay, you're so smart. What kind of oak is that? I didn't know. Turns out a 40-acre hillside in South Alabama will have 25 species of oaks. Wow. Name them. <laughs> Name, Alabama is the center of hickory diversity in the world. Name them. Name them. Alabama is the center of magnolia diversity in North America. Name them. Mobile County is the center of grass diversity in eastern North America. Name something besides Bermuda grass in St. Augustine. Johnson grass. All of them... All of them introduced, all of them like kudzu, introduced from other places. Yeah. It's interesting. We know more about what's invaded Alabama than we know about what's here. We never discovered this landscape. I think in many ways we've always been uncomfortable with diversity in Alabama. And so we've tried to simplify it in lots of ways. It's always very dangerous. Uh, when we tell our stories about, um, about our history, can I say it? We don't like talking about the diversity within our history. We only, we like history the best when we get to make it up, right? And it's only about certain aspects of our history. So we don't talk about the First Nations. We don't talk about the pre-Columbian world here. We don't talk about... African-American history in this state the way we should. We don't talk about even among Europeans. We don't talk about the fact that during the Civil War, probably half our ancestors, either if, if, if they fought in the Civil War, either deserted or refused to fight for the Confederacy. And a lot of counties in Alabama talk about celebrating heritage. The counties where we're raising the rebel flags, their ancestors fought tooth and toenail to keep that rebel flag out of Winston County. In Mississippi, they fought tooth and toenail to keep the rebel flag out of Jones County and the free state of Jones. We don't tell that story, do we? It's a very complex and diverse place. There's, a, there's some great myths, too, about, uh, about uh, the, the so-called uh, Celtic heritage, the uh, Scots-Irish heritage of the South. In the, in the remote areas and how it influenced what the South is and what it should be because it's a simple story. Well, you tell that to the Rousseaus up in the hollers of Paint Rock who've been there all along, these French families. You tell that to the Shumperts 
who, who, were, who were in Mississippi and Alabama long before a lot of Irish and Scots folks were. All of these have been forgotten because we like to simplify where we are. What is, I, I'm going to leave you uh, with, with that thought about, uh, about that, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the diversity of Alabama so that you are not left with the images you see outside your car window. Get outside your car, okay? Walk around the woods sometimes. The Delta, an incredible place at the bottom of the state, probably one of the best preserved deltaic areas in the country. Not the most diverse part of the state by any means, but probably the most diverse delta in the U.S., uh, a really interesting place. Fish diversity is absolutely astonishing in Alabama. I, I wish I'd show you the big weird ones, uh, the, the paddlefish, uh, but uh, the shovel-nosed cat. And, uh, but what, what incredible, the, the, the swamps. My wife took these pictures, by the way. Really, really beautiful pictures. This great delta egg system. Not a, not a bit of kudzu anywhere, is there? Great lilies of all types. Turtle diversity, unparalleled anywhere. Bird diversity. Um, these great jungles, beautiful jungles of Alabama with the lilies, things we don't think about, we don't see because we don't get out of our car enough. The mountain laurel, which stretches from the mountains all the way down to the coast, by the way. I like to remind people that mountain laurel has been on the coast far longer than it's been in the Appalachians. Rhododendrons, uh, uh, Buckeyes, Alabama is a Buckeye state. Alabama and Georgia are the centers of azalea, of deciduous azalea diversity in the world. We're finding more species. We think we may have found another species this spring of azalea in Alabama that's growing wild in the woods. The prairies, what Montgomery once was, what surrounded Montgomery, an astonishing place. We wiped it out pretty soon. We wiped it out early on, so we don't have a picture of that anymore, but there's still great remnants, one of the great, uh, the great most diverse prairies in, in North America. We're here in Alabama. And the longleaf pine ecosystem, 92 million acres of the country uh, were covered by longleaf. And yet kudzu is our symbol. An, an incredibly beautiful forest, an astonishingly beautiful forest, the richest forest in North America for plant species. That's what we should be seeing when we see Alabama. That's the image of grasses. That's the great grass diversity that's part of that longleaf prairie ecosystem. The center of carnivorous plant diversity in the world, a place at Splinter Hill where there's 60 virtually 60 species per square meter in a square yard, 60 different plant species. Astonishing diversity, orchids of all kinds, lilies of all kinds. The mountains, the Rebecca Mountains, one of my favorite places in the world, one of the most beautiful places in the world with incredible diversity uh, all along it. That's the picture of Alabama we should be seeing. That's the picture of diversity we should be talking about. Quit trying to make it all kudzu. I've said enough strange things that you probably have lots of questions. I think we should start out with your best kudzu story. So, yeah. He's grabbing the microphones um, and don't raise your hand. We're recording today's session for our YouTube, so um, either Michael or Leslie will pass you a microphone. Um, Leslie's over there. <laughs> Back in the uh, 1980s, between Eufaula and, I guess, Montgomery, there was a train track, and a trestle burned down, and so the railroad left a whole bunch of boxcars stored on that track, and kudzu grew over the cars, and tourists would stop and take pictures of where kudzu had caught the train. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Good, good. So that, that's very good. That's a great, great story. So... But, you know, it's, it's, it, that's another thing, a classic situation. So the farmers, the farmers said, this kudzu stuff is, is ridiculous. I mean, my cows are eating it out. My horses are eating it out. By the way, if you could maintain it, it'd actually be pretty good for the cows and horses. They don't colic on it. 
Uh, so, it, and it's, but it's very nutritious. But the farmers abandoned it. But the, but the railroads said in the, in, the 19, in the 1920s and 1930s, we were building railroads and, and roads all over the place, and they needed something cheap to put on the embankments. And the Soil Conservation Service over here was producing 70 million seedlings of kudzu. <laughs> and that was pretty cheap because you go over the, go over, they, so they planted it all along the roadsides. So what happened? There weren't any cows there. There weren't any deer there. We'd shot out all the deer, right? There weren't, weren't any deer. Nothing was going to graze that kudzu, so it just kept growing and growing and growing. And it covered things just like cat's claw does, just like trumpet's creeper does, and it, it covered things all over the south. Um, and those images became very arresting, very interesting to people up north where things don't grow worth a toot, right? So, so they're thinking, gosh, you know, they're up in Boston, and you see these pictures of this plant covering a, I mean, they, they can't conceive of that in Boston. I mean, it takes, you know, it takes forever. It, trees grow in six inches a year up there. They're growing three or three to six feet a year here. So this was really strange to them. And they said, this is, you know, this is, this says something about that. So this pictures, even though there were little isolated fragments of what our real landscape looked like, they were very persuasive and very persuasive to us. So yeah, there are lots of good pictures and, and Great pictures. I wish I, in fact, y'all have got some good pictures here in the archives that are better than what I've got uh, that, that show the, of the, the attempts to show that kudzu was going to take over the world because it was taking over cars, it was taking over school buses, it was taking over houses, it was taking over railroad cars. Really great, great stories. Yeah. Right here? Yes, sir. I have long thought that a great science fiction or horror movie would be directed by a Japanese director and be called Kudzu. Right. And that it would, in fact, be about the vine that overtook the South. A few years ago, I read uh, that there was in development in Hollywood a kudzu motion picture. And I wonder if you've ever heard of that or know anything about it or you've been contacted about such things. <laughs> no, I haven't. And, of course, if, if they had any sense, they wouldn't contact me at all. They would want to shuffle me off the scene. Uh, because I'm not going to tell the story they, they, they want to tell. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it, it is interesting what's happened. There, there, there are so many things that people have built based on bad information. So that's seven to nine million acres of the South being covered. There were actually companies that were being set up that were trying to get funding to, u to process the seven to nine million acres of kudzu into fuel. There was more than one or one company. They're all defunct now, by the way. But not before they took a lot of people's money because there were 79 million acres of kudzu out there. And all we got to do is go harvest it. Nobody wants it. We just go harvest it. Well, they didn't know how they were going to harvest it. There wasn't 79 million acres of kudzu out there. There was only 250,000 acres at best, and most of that was mixed with other plants. So it was a problem. But yes, I'm sure that somebody has decided. There was a cartoon strip called Kudzu, right? There was a musical, a, a musical on, off Broadway called Kudzu. So surely somebody planned a movie. Uh, so yeah. Do we know yet what the uh, unintended side effects of the Kudzu bug may be? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to overstate uh, about the, the dangers of the kudzu bug in the same way we overstated kudzu. But it probably creates real problems. It certainly has created some problems for soybean farmers, because the kudzu bug prefers kudzu, but it will it will gather on soybeans. I have seen it on my beans, my garden beans, uh, my, my pole beans, occasionally uh, in Mobile. But I haven't seen a whole lot of damage. I see far more problems with the bean beetle. Uh, but there is a bit of concern. The biggest problem from the kudzu bug, and it's probably we deserve it, I, I, I feel certain we deserve it, is that kudzu bugs love to be inside houses. So they're, they're beginning to flock to houses. They love white. So your, your drywall, your, your, your white walls, the kudzu bugs love that. They love the white. They love to be inside of houses. And they're coming into houses now by the, the hundreds of thousands. So there's your next monster movie is the kudzu bug <laughs> inside the house. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to share. Well, I've known my wife since 1981, and her aunt had a little corner with probably less than an acre, full-blown kudzu patch. 
And about 10 years ago, we built a house on the other side of the dirt road where yeah. the Kudza patch was. And uh, now it's gone because her cousin is building houses there. It's just gone. Right. But from 1981 up until we built our house about 10 years ago, that patch never changed. It never got any bigger. But the thing that was weird to me, and I, I never really thought about it until you talked talking about it, but when I would mow that side of the road and some of that kudzu would hung up in the wheels on my, uh, <clears throat> on my mower deck, I would stop when I got through, and I would pick those things off like they were plagued so that they wouldn't get on my side. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and in actuality, it, it, once it's disengaged like that, it doesn't spread very well. It doesn't spread very well by seeds, unlike a lot of plants, which do spread very well by yeah. seed. But it's so, that thing in your head. It's that thing in your head. It, right. It, it's there. So there's a, there's a great thing. So these little patches, these little triangles of kudzu are all over the South, and they all have a story. And there's one I remember from Isabel. You know where anybody know where Isabel is in Chilton County? So this is a little, little place in Isabella, and I remember I went, to, went there, and we used to camp out there, and we had a little, we'd stay in the farm, it was the old family farm, not mine, but a friend of mine's, and, and he said, you know, and, and I'll tell you about this kudzu patch, he said, you know, there was a disagreement about the ownership of the land, and so this, there was this little triangle that nobody could agree on which member of the family owned it, so one of the mean members of the family went out and sewed it in kudzu so that nobody could ever use it again. And that kudzu patch sat there. Well, the truth was is that there was a disputed land claim there and nobody could use it. And the kudzu just simply persisted. I doubt anybody planted it there. It may have been left over from the old days, but it became part of the legend that uh, it's, it's funny how those things are. And it really is about if you understand grace. So, you know, somebody says, well, why do I get rid of kudzu? Well, if you can cut it back, and mow it, it it's gone. Uh, goats are goats are pretty efficient at doing it. Uh, they're easy to move around. People are doing it with goats, uh, so it's it's not that hard to get rid of. Chemicals aren't as effective against it for a lot of reasons, but uh, but grazing is very effective and mowing is very effective. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's your thoughts about the bamboo that seems to be taking over everywhere? Hmm. Oh, good. Well, this is fun. Originally, allow me to say, probably about one-sixth of Alabama. Originally, uh, let me define what that means. Before humans got to Alabama, about 10,000, 12,000 years ago, one-sixth of Alabama was covered by bamboo. The cane break, ever heard of the cane break? The cane break is what we encountered here in the Black Belt. It's where almost all of our cotton went. We wiped out the cane break. And when we wiped out the cane break, which is one of the really cool features of Alabama that we've completely forgotten about, when we wiped out the native cane break, we wiped out species with it. Bachman's warbler uh, was lost because it bred only in cane breaks. Uh, jaguars and jaguarundis, I, you probably don't care about them. I like them all. I like them a lot. They were in the cane break. The bears were in the cane break. They were part of our, they were part of Alabama. We have, we now know that we've got at least three species of native bamboo. We call it cane. One's the Appalachian cane that grows only in the mountains. There's, uh, and, and almost only in Alabama. There's another species uh, that's, that grows in the longleaf savanna that uh, the Indians called, uh, that the Choctaw called Kunshak. Uh, and you'll see that name come up again and again because that native cane was so important to Choctaw and Creek culture. It was hugely important. And then we've got the giant cane, which William Bartram, when he came to Alabama in 1790, Thank you for letting me talk about something besides kudzu. <laughs> William Bartram in 17, in 1770 is coming to Alabama and he's driving up the Alabama River and he says there's cane 40 feet tall. It's a controversial comment, but as it turns out, it probably was true. This native cane was all over Alabama. In the late 19th and early 20th century, we introduced, because we never believed that what we have in Alabama is worth anything, so we always go to Japan and we always go to Asia and we get, we get, our, we get our sawtooth oaks because, boy, you know, a Japanese oak is going to be much better for our deer than the 40 species of native oaks that are in our woods. Help us. So we've got, we, now we're planting this sawtooth oak from Japan. We did the same thing with bamboo. We were rich in bamboo, but we went to, we went to Asia 
after we had wiped out our much, much of our native bam bamboo and we brought in Phyllostachys species from Asia, the golden bamboo that we use for fishing poles. And it is spreading. It, it is taking over. I don't think it's a huge threat, honestly. I think it's less of a threat, certainly less than privet, uh, probably almost, probably even less of a threat than, than kudzu. Uh, but it, it is a problem in certain areas because people don't understand how to get rid of it. And it's actually easy to control. And we got rid of our native cane very easily. I can tell you how they did it, but I don't want to because I don't want you getting rid of any more of our native cane. But, uh, but yes, bamboo's out there. It's another one thing. And now there's a, now there's attempt because we like to simplify everything in Alabama. So, it, you know, it's going to be cotton. We're, we got to stay cotton. Well... You know, we can't do cotton anymore. Let's do peanuts, right? So peanuts. It's soybeans. Only one thing can save the state. So now we're going to save the black belt. And how are we going to save the black belt? We're going to go to Asia, get Asian bamboo, bring it and plant it in the back black belt, and it's going to save the black belt. Okay. When I hear somebody say, we're going to save Alabama by promoting diversity, I'll believe it. <laughs> we may finally save the state that way. Uh, but at any rate, bamboo is a, bamboo's a, a great part of our history. It's, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm glad I get to talk we about bamboo. We have two questions and comments on this same row, so I'm going to start with you, ma'am, and then, sir, you'll go right after her. You'll just pass it to him when you're done. Mine's just a comment. Growing up in Mobile, I was told many a time that, that kudzu could grow straight through concrete. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they, they're all those stories. And you know, the funny thing was Mobile, it never really grew that well in Mobile. The truth is, there were just a few small patches. I, I was trying to find some photographs and realized how hard it is to find kudzu in Mobile. It doesn't like those sandier soils. It prefers the, it prefers the clay soils for, uh, farther north. But yeah, the myth was uh, it far outseated the reach of the vine. What happens to the uh, what happens to the beetle if it eats uh, marijuana? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know what it would smell like. It probably smell like a skunk. So it's uh, yeah, you have to know something there. But it's it, it is uh, I don't know what happens to the beetle if it eats marijuana. Uh, but it is it is we are seeing we are seeing the the, the beetle on other types of plants. When when I was young, I was. Uh living in Mobile, and there was a bamboo forest nearby. Right. We used to harvest it quite often to make pots out of and all kinds of stuff. And I heard that a Asian bamboo forest will only last 30 years and it will die out. And in fact, that did happen right. in Mobile. Have you heard that? Or? Bamboo, I'm so glad I get to talk about bamboo. <laughs> Bamboo is, is, called, is, a, is a plant that's called monocarpic. That means that it, throughout its lifetime, it flowers once and dies. So it takes about 15 to 20 to 30 years for a colony of bamboo to reach flowering stage. And when it does, most of that colony dies out. And that's what you see happening. And when it flowers, it's producing seeds. The seeds are spread and, and it reestablishes the forest. In the case of the Asian bamboos, because the conditions aren't right for that seed to be fertile, when the colony dies out, you rarely see any seedlings develop as a result. So that's what's happening. And it does die out. And, and to some degree, our native cane died out, but, it, but its seed set was very important to the wildlife. It was, it was hugely important to Carolina parakeets, for example. Another thing we wiped out when we wiped out the, when we wiped out the bamboo, uh, uh, the, the native cane. So, yeah, there you go. Flowering and, and uh, it, it, monocarpic plants. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'll try to. For um, historical purposes, I recall my grandfather, um, who um, he and my great uncle were uh, instrumental in the Department of Agriculture. Right. Right. You suggested that uh, erosion was really not the problem, but I think what he was concerned about, and you know, it's ongoing because my brother now is right, right. the land. Um, historically, they were worried about the dust bowl creeping. They were, and they were, and all of that, all those things, yeah. 
and that was a that absolutely was the case. They, they, the, the Dust Bowl became a huge image. So I, I, I challenge people to do this experiment in their yard to, uh, to help us understand what happens with erosion in, in Alabama. Go out in your yard and make a bare space and try to keep it bare. Bill, you may not realize this, but while you've been giving this wonderful talk, Cubsy has completely covered your car. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Somebody should do that. Somebody should pull that stunt on me. You would do that, wouldn't you? Uh, that's right. All right. Well, we are out of time for today, but if you have any questions or comments, I'm sure our speaker would be happy to speak with each of you personally. Thank you so much for coming.